This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. John Putch is often referred to as an independent film maverick because one of his first indie efforts, Valerie Flake, landed him at the 1999 Sundance Film Festival. His other notable films include the alt indie cult favorites Bachelor Man, Mojave Phone Booth, which you have to see, and the Route 30 trilogy films. His television directing just depresses the heck out of me. He's directed Family Tools, The Goodwin Games, The Middle, Body of Pool, Scrubs, Cougar Town, My Name is Earl, Ugly Betty, Grounded for Life, Outsourced. He has his own apartment at both CBS and NBC. He's directed multiple television movies and miniseries. John, welcome back. Where do you find time to sleep? That is the greatest intro ever. Uh, I sleep just fine. But, uh, boy, that sounds important. Thank you. You're more than welcome. You know, today I want to talk about directing, but before we talk about the new stuff, I, I need to find out what's happening with Route 32, the trilogy. Well, uh, the trilogy is complete. I finished Route 33 uh, a year ago, and the, the whole entire trilogy is now available on Blu-ray and DVD in a box set which is available at Route30Trilogy.com. <laughs> and uh, if anyone, the, one of the last screenings that you'll see uh, of Route 33 locally in L.A. is tomorrow at the Directors Guild of America in West Hollywood at 3 p.m. in Theater 2. We're going to show it on a DCP, which I made here in my home using Adobe Premiere and a media encoder. You are wow. an amazing technologist. That's all there is to it. It's just <laughs> I leave am the, the rest. Geek, Larry. <laughs> when you're getting ready to do anything, and you're in the prep stages, and you're wearing your director hat, what are you what are you thinking about? Or, uh, what are you prepping to get ready to direct a project, whether it's a film or a television series? Well, it's it's wildly different between film and TV. The the TV schedule is they have just endless endless meetings. So the first day you get there, there's a meeting about the concept of the whole script, and you must page turn the script at least 10 times before you shoot. And all you do is talk about the color of this and the, the angle of that and the stunts in this and the blah, you know, they have a very regimented set of meetings that go along and location scouts leading up to your shoot. Uh, on a movie, you know, it's it's quite different. You're, you're meeting with, uh, you know, all the creative departments and what, you know, your vision is really what they're going off of. Whereas on tel in television, you're really just a hired gun and the vision is set and you're just really coming in and orchestrating it for them, puppeteering the, the, uh, you know, the script till it's uh, finished shooting. If it, would, um, it be, so that's good. would it be correct to say that with television, you're really just blocking talent and cameras and with film, you're crafting more of the whole story? Uh, yes, with an asterisk on the blocking uh, talent and stuff, because you you do get you do participate a bit more than that uh, if you want to. Um, but yeah, I, I would have to say yeah, you, there's more. I feel a little more uh, uh, creatively involved in in a film uh, scenario than than a TV scenario. But that is not to say that the TV is not fun and and they welcome your creativity as well. You know, you're really just putting your little touch on it or, or not. You're, you're literally just falling in line with everyone else and, uh, and delivering the, uh, the episode the way it's supposed to be. When you're directing and you're going on a location scout, what are you looking for? Well, it all starts with what the script is asking for. And, uh, you know, you, you are looking for things that look really cool in a frame. So, uh, for instance, I was doing a show called Rush Hour last week, which is a new show on CBS, and we there was this scene written to take place on Sepulveda Dam over here in uh, uh, Encino, and that great spillway that's used in movies occasionally. And, uh, you know, we actually got the location, but we we went there and said, okay, here's, here's how we're going to shoot it, and here are the angles we want and everything. And that was a case of a great uh, uh, location that was written in. But if it isn't written in, and you you say and it says, "Hey, a building in Koreatown," you know, you have to, you <laughs> with the location scout, you go down to Koreatown and you look around for a, a building and you hope it's pretty cool looking. It's hard. I think L.A. is hard for locations for me because I'm so used to going to Pennsylvania where everything is f f gorgeous. 
and everywhere you look, there's a beautiful picture. Here, it's different. You know, it's it's urban and it's flat, and there's not good architecture here. So when you do a movie and or when you do a show in L.A., you know, you are limited to how the city looks, and you know, sometimes it just doesn't doesn't look that exciting. You know, that's why you see pictures of of the skyline of L.A. in between every shot on a TV show. <laughs> you know, the thing <laughs> LA. There's always some helicopter or drone shot of these incredible office buildings and skyscrapers, because really, if you look to the valley, there's nothing <laughs> you know, if you look to, to the Santa Monica or it's the beach. And, and that's, you know, so L.A. is kind of go elsewhere to shoot. That's my advice. <laughs> don't, don't tell Film L.A. I said that. Sorry, Film L.A. <laughs> um, let's talk working with actors for just a second. And again, there's a difference if you're working with an established series or if you're creating a pilot or if you're doing a film. Because with a pilot and a film, you've got more creative flexibility as you're trying to figure out what the characters are. But how do you work with actors? And, and what kinds of instructions are you looking to give them? Again, wearing your director hat. Yeah, well, you know, if you cast your film right with the correct people and you have to have an eye for talent for that, then pretty much 90% of your job is done. And then you become the uh, the audience member for them and guide that actor through his his or her performance and help them look good and sound good and, and, and come off as, as correctly. Uh, if you don't cast it right or you have no control of the casting and, and it's not the right fit, the actor, then your work as a director is much more difficult. Uh, and you have to spend a little more time working with this person and, and you know, help them into this character. Um, so I, 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 I let people I, I like to see what people bring. I don't like to tell them what to do. And I observe how they interact in the scene in a rehearsal or two, and then I might offer a suggestion or a, or a tip or, a, or or help them if they need help. But if they're if they're if they're working great, and I don't try to go in there just to say something because I'm a director. I just you know let them do it. What's a typical note? Well, a lot of times, um, too too big or too small. It comes down to simple stuff like that, you know, for the tone of whatever it is you're doing. Like if you you know you're doing a broad comedy like Route 30, you know everyone kind of knows. And I'm often building people up. I'm saying, no, 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 no. This is not an episode of Perry Mason. This is Blazing Saddles, <laughs> you know. And I and and, and I say you got to honk your horn or you know be the you know think of the clown when you're doing you know when you're doing this movie. So that's uh, that's kind of that's a comment I make, and sometimes you know you got to go the other way, and you have to bring them down because they're too big. Uh, sim simple stuff. What are you looking for in an actor when you're casting? Are you looking for some invisible spark, or are you looking for an interpretation? Uh, what are you looking for? Well, I think you just have to. Be, you 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 are open to anything, and I look for something that will surprise me, or something that doesn't I didn't think of. And that tells me, oh, I've got a different take on this, and boy, did I like it. So that makes it interesting to me. You have to really be, when you write stuff and you direct it, you, you have to be open to someone else's uh, 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 interpretation of what you wrote. And if it's better the way they present it, if it's just better than you ever hoped, you, you, you need to jump on that person and cast them. So I like to be surprised, and I look, I hope that somebody comes in and, like, makes me go, oh, I didn't even think of that. So I like that. How much work do you do with your actors in rehearsal, and how much work do you do with them once they're on set? Um, Two-part answer. Television, you don't work with them at all until you see them on set when you block the scene and the entire crew is standing around watching you while you block the scene. It's very nerve-wracking for an actor if you're not experienced. Uh, and you, you know, you, you say, Hey, start, start over there, end up over there. You need to pick up the file, you know, <laughs> at this point, and you have to end up leaving through that door. And then literally you say, okay, see what happens. And, um, and that's what happens in, in the TV uh, realm in, in rehearsal film. I would rehearse more often, uh, even on my, my little movies, same thing. You come to set, we rehearse. Maybe we do it more times than you get to do on a TV show. And then while we're setting up, I'll maybe work with them, work with the actors a little uh, or, or not. I, you know, I'm in the habit of hiring professionals, so I really don't have to spend a lot of time rehearsing with them. I send them off and 
run your lines together. Make sure everybody's comfortable with the scene before they leave the blocking. And uh, and kind of that. I, I don't ever do pre-rehearsals. I haven't in a long time. I'm not a big fan of read-throughs. I hate, hate doing read-throughs. Why is that? Uh, I think you just don't get an honest read of the material, in my opinion, because people are nervous and they're performing and, you know, you're sitting around a table like a play and that's not how you do it when you shoot it. So it doesn't seem, and, and I, I never get an honest reaction from a reading. So I kind of never do it. But it could be argued that on set is the most expensive place to rehearse. And as you said, it's nerve wracking and yet you find it the most helpful. Yeah. Uh, Again, on my little movies, there's no expense really because we're micro budget and we're small. Um, on, on a on TV, when you you know when you're expected to know your your stuff when you show up, so they're really everyone who walks into a television show and rehearses a scene knows that they have like maybe two passes added in there to you know to get it blocked, and then while the crew is setting up, they have time to really you know you know lock in what they just did on the on the blocking. But it's never, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, a show will have problems with a script or a scene or an actor who's a, a pretty big name will will not be happy with you know, the material in that scene for some reason because it just bumps them somehow and that things will grind to a halt and the writer will come down and the producers will come down and they'll talk for a long time and try to figure out, you know, how to how to smooth out that bump for this this person and sometimes that can. Uh, can take it can you know really eat into your day i've lost you know half an hour 45 minutes sometimes when that happens hmm. but just roll with it larry you know i'm there i'm supposed I'm, I'm there until they want me to leave that's all i said <laughs> <you know? laughs> well let's talk about one where you did have a little bit more control which is the father and the bear what's the thumbnail plot description it's a retired character actor who has diagnosed dementia and he longs to perform at this beloved summer theater one last time because he has re retired five years earlier. So against his daughter's wishes, he uh, accepts a role from the newly installed artistic director who's unaware of his condition. And through the just the sheer humanity and cleverness of the staff and cast of the show, they help him sail through the one night performance to, to, to great success. And uh, I, I won't, you know, spoiler, I'm not going to give away the end, but it, it's got a very interesting uh, special How ending. How can you not spoil the ending when you said he does the play to great success? That sounds like a perfect ending. Music swells fade to black to me. Well, well, it is, but there's a there's a caveat to it. And, and it's 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 rather uh, it deals with, um, you know, this this it deals with this disease and this Ill, illness. I'll just tell you, he doesn't remember that he was ever set, set foot in the theater six months later. He doesn't remember oh, wow. that he had this incredible success. So it's kind of, it's, it's chilling in a way. Uh, and the reason I, I, it's really a theater story. And it's so fun because it really shows summer stock the way it was. And I grew up doing that when I was young and at this theater. So not only I was shooting a movie in this theater I grew up in that my father ran his you know our we're all over that place still. It's still in operation. It's like 65 years in. And I'm shooting a movie with an actor who stars in the film who I also grew up with who worked at the theater for over 30 40 years and I'm using footage I shot, Super 8 footage I shot from the 70s through the 80s of this actor in this film as flashbacks to show his life span across this, uh, you know, his, his career, which is he's a character in the movie. So it's, it's like I'm using all the, the footage, Larry, I've, I've collected all my life in my lifetime from this place. And I've created a story around it and I'm, I'm using it in, in the film. So it's really uh, it's quite a it, it's weird and magical. And I, I'm, I'm just fascinated while I'm editing and I'm very emotional while I'm editing it, too. So production's done. You're editing. What are you editing in and what gear are you using? Well, I'm using um, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, the Premiere Pro. Uh, which I'm very fond of. This will be my second feature on it. I did Route 33 on it. Great, enjoyed it. Uh, we, what else? Um, I uh, do. You want to see? Do you want to see my edit? How uh, I? I'm how afraid I to ask, work? but yes, I'd love to see. <laughs> 
This is, I love this idea. Instead of giant hard drives just piled up all over your, your, your desk and then putting them in the closet with power cables and all that stuff, I use this. This is a Rocket Store video toaster. It's Thunderbolt. It holds two full-size or laptop drives. I, I buy the raw drives. I put them in. I edit. And then when I want to, you know, when I'm done with it, I just I store these on the bookshelf in a little case like this. That Thank is you. very cool. <laughs> when do you expect to wrap well, editing? Uh, wow, I got. I think I'll lock picture by Christmas because I have nothing on my plate. I can just sit here and edit like a madman, which I really enjoy. And uh, I probably, I think, with all the sound work and all that stuff, I feel like March, end of March, I'll have it done and ready to like put out there. Well, we'll bring you back in a few months and get a status report on how the editing is going. John, for people that want to keep track of all the stuff you're doing, what website can they go to? I would say go to putchfilms.com, P-U-T-C-H-F-I-L-M-S.com, and then from that you can go to the Route 30 site, the Father and the Bear site, whatever you want. <laughs> John Putch is the person we've been talking to, a producer, a director, a filmmaker, his website is putchfilms.com. And John, thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from The Buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now. Or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching The Digital Production Buzz.